Hello everyone and welcome to today's 1800 Respect webinar. Today's topic is violence against women and their children, what the data can tell us. We are pleased to welcome our presenter for today, Dr. Peter Cox. Dr. Peter Cox is a Senior, Re Senior Research Officer at ANROSE. She has a PhD from the School of Public Health and Community Medicine at UNSW and has worked in project delivery, education and knowledge translation across government and non-government organisations. Dr. Cox is the researcher and author of Violence Against Women, Additional Analysis of the Australian Bureau of Statistics Personal Safety St Survey. This webinar is live and interactive. You are encouraged to participate by posing questions to the presenter, which can be typed into the chat box, which is located at the bottom left hand side of your screen. If you are experiencing difficulty hearing the sound during the webinar, please dial the 1800 support number listed in the chat box. I would now like to hand you over to Peter to begin. Good afternoon. Um, so my name is Peter Cox. I am Senior Research Officer at ANROSE. Um, in this webinar, we're going to be, I'm just trying to get it so that it, my screen is moving. There we go. Hi. Okay, there we go. Um, so in today's webinar, we're going to be talking in detail about the personal safety survey data. Um, I'll give you a bit of an outline of what that data is um, and why it's important. We'll then be looking at how men and women experience violence differently, the kind of nature of violence and how that's separated. Um, I'll then go into some detail about what the PSS can show us about partner violence, specifically how often it happens, what incidents um, are characterised as and what happens afterwards, so the kind of support that women seek. The final bit of the presentation will be a look at the ANROS um, support services that are available for working with this data. So to begin with, and I'm once again having... Um, okay, there we go. So what data are we talking about? Okay, so the PSS is Australia's best quantitative data on violence against women. It's also the best um, data on any kind of um, violence in Australia. It has a really large um, po population that it looks at. It looks at a, it interviews about 17,000 um, people. It's a household survey, which means that it actually involves going into people's home and sitting with a person. Um, it's a really long survey, so it goes into a lot of detail about people's demographics. It talks about um, people's experience of stalking. Um, the most recent incident of eight different types of violence, so this includes the most recent incident of physical assault, physical threat, sexual assault and sexual threat, um, and both all of those by both a male or female perpetrator. Um, it has a separate section on emotional abuse and then a separate section again on partner abuse. And that's kind of detailed in the right hand side of the slide in front of you. Um, the PSS is run by the ABS, it's run every four years and it's part of the national plan. It's a survey that has quite a lot of um, criticism that has been given to it in the past and some of that is legitimate. Um, so some of that's around the fact that it is a household survey which means that the focus is on people, with, um, people who live in houses so it has some limitations as far as access to people who might be in institutionalised care settings. It also is a survey that's primarily done at this point in English although there are some provisions in the future for being able to actually do it um, as a um, survey on a tablet and so therefore for multiple languages to be available. Um, but some of the criticisms that get put towards the PSS are actually based on not knowing necessarily what's available in the survey. So since I've been doing this work, I've had some people who've come up to me and they've said, you know, the, the PSS you know, really should involve some information on women's um, or, or men's consumption of alcohol in incidents or whether their children are affected or why women separate. And all those things are actually already included within the survey. It's just that when people aren't necessarily aware of the detail because it hasn't been in the public domain before. So the 
PSS is largely an untapped resource. Um, it's been a survey that's been running for a while, but um, it isn't used in nearly as much detail as what's been actually collected in the survey. Um, and that's one of the reasons that ANRISE has actually done the detailed analysis that we did last year, is to be able to bring to the front, to the fore, some of that detailed information to be able to inform policy and practice. The PSS is a really important survey. Um, it's our only reliable population estimates. So it means that any time that you're hearing someone say something that indicates how big the problem of domestic violence or sexual assault is, they're most likely relying on the PSS um, data. So it's used in media, it's used in advocacy, it's used in policy. Um, it's also the basis of a range of other calculations. So you might be familiar with the burden of disease work that's done or some of the economic impact calculations that you might have used in your own work, all these numbers have to have the PSS as the basis. Their calculations don't work without those estimates. And so it's actually kind of this underpinning of most of the kind of numbers really that are out in the public domain. In addition, I think that numbers are really important generally in how it is that we talk about violence in Australia. Um, and so people start the conversation by saying, look, this happens to a lot of people. And when they're doing that, they're using the PSS. So I'd like to now just stop briefly for a poll question. Um, so you'll be able to see that in um, on your screen, and if you could just indicate which of these um, you see as most relevant. A survey form appears on screen with a question and five tick box responses. The survey question is, it is likely that we have people listening today with different levels of familiarity with PSS. Could you tell me whether you have one, used it before and feel confident with it, two, used it before but remain pretty nervous about using it, three, considered using the PSS but decided against it, four, know of it but never used it, and five, never heard of the PSS before. Okay, I think we, we have a, a good initial indication. Um, so what we're seeing is that most of you haven't actually heard of PSS before. Um, which I think means that hopefully this will give you a bit more information on what it is that the PSS does. So what I'm now going to talk to you a li little bit about is the information in the PSS that um, some of the information that's available around gendered patterns of violence. And this kind of information I think can be really useful if you're speaking to someone who is maybe talking about how men and women experience violence in the same way. And what the PSS shows us is that it's actually really quite different. And I've used this kind of information when I've actually been um, talking on the radio about the PSS. Um, when the report was launched, we had a bit of um, media coverage. And this was one of the questions that came up a lot for me. So in those contexts, I would talk about the fact that both men and women are most likely to be assaulted by a man, particularly when I'm talking about physical assault. Um, but the, the nature of that assault is very different. So for men, they're most likely to be assaulted in a place of entertainment. And so that could be somewhere like a club or a pub, um, a football game, the theatre. Um, but they could also, they're also most likely to be assaulted by a stranger. In contrast, women are most likely to be assaulted in their home and they're most likely to be assaulted by a partner. So women are also most likely to experience repeat um, experiences of victimization. So unsurprisingly, if, you're, uh, if you've been assaulted by a stranger, then that person is no longer a stranger to you. So the way the data actually works means that we're really seeing how strong that difference is between these kind of repetitions of violence experienced by women, but this kind of single incidence by men. What you now have on your screen is a couple of examples of the infographics that are available um, through the ANROSE website. So these are some of the um, infographics that we developed to express some of these, um, the stuff that I've just described to you. I'd now like to go on to talk about some of the data that's available around partner violence. Um, now, before we kind of begin that, I want to really emphasize that the PSS provides information on violence perpetrated by a partner. It doesn't necessarily provide us with data on domestic violence. And what I mean by the distinction here is that when we talk about domestic violence, we're typically referring to a ongoing pattern of violence that occurs within a relationship where that involves um, fear, um, coercive control. What 
the PSS collects is actually data about like a different phenomenon. What it collects is about whether someone has experienced at least one incident of violence um, by a partner, so by um, an intimate partner. So this actually means that not all the people who are within the category of partner violence will have experienced what we think of as domestic violence. And for this reason, we talk about um, partner violence rather than domestic. So how many women experience partner violence? Um, during our analysis of the PSS data, we actually did some additional work around these estimates. So previously, the ABS had talked about um, women's experience of violence by a partner they were living with or a cohabiting partner. And they found that about one in six, so 16.9% of all women had experienced at least one incident of violence by a partner they were living with. They also had in their data set, but not so much in the public domain, that one in nine women, or close to a million, so 990,000 or 11.3%, had experienced violence by a boyfriend, girlfriend or date. So that's a partner that they weren't living with. What we did was that we combined those. Um, and this wasn't just a simple kind of adding up of numbers. It actually required some analysis by the ABS because there are some people who have experienced violence by both a cohabiting and a non-cohabiting partner. And what we found was that one in four women, or 25.1%, or close to 2.2 million women in Australia, had experienced at least one incident of violence by a partner they may or may not have been living with. This next slide is looking at um, women's experience of, um, it's the same kind of information, but describing it slightly differently. So what we can see here is that this number here that I'm circling at the moment is what we were just talking about, the 25.1%. And that these are those two that we were, um, that was broken up from there. What we can also see when we're kind of making this into this bit of a tree here is that this is actually a really large percentage of our overall number over here. So about four out of 10 women have experienced violence by a male perpetrator since the age of 15, of which the majority, 65.3%, um, are by a intimate partner, so this number up here. In addition, and I'm sorry, um, this is actually just related to the slide we were just on. Um, it's important to note that women may also experience violence by other women. The majority of that violence isn't in a partner context, and even when we are adding that number in, we don't see a large jump in the estimate. So although there's close to 800,000 women who experience violence by a, another woman, that doesn't jump our estimate much at all for the overall number of women who have experienced violence. So that 38% um, percent that we're seeing on the far left-hand side of that tree only goes up to slightly over 40% where, when we're adding all those um, women who've experienced violence to have traded by another woman. So when we're talking about types of violence um, that women may experience if they're experiencing partner violence, we see that more women report that they've experienced physical violence than sexual violence. Um, it's important in this context, though, to also note that the majority of these women are reporting assault, they're not reporting threat. So within the PSS context, the definition of violence can include both um, assault and threat. Um, of physical violence or sexual violence, those being separated. Um, but we're finding that nine out of 10 women are saying that they've experienced um, assault um, and threat is less common. So we're looking at about one in four women are saying that they've experienced incident of physical threat. Obviously there's a large overlap between those two groups who have experienced both physical assault and physical threat. Here are just a couple of more characteristics of partner violence that we get from the PSS survey. We know that the most recent incident of cohabiting partner violence, so using that more narrow definition limited to people who are living together, that at least nine out of 10 of those incidents are happening in the home. So they really are kind of behind closed doors. Um, and that in about half of cases, women indicated that drugs or alcohol contributed to the incident. So this is the woman's own assessment of the incident, and it's reporting both her own and her partner's use of drug and alcohol, the majority of that being used by the perpetrator. 
We also know that since the age of 15, um, over 400,000 women have experienced partner violence during pregnancy, and over half a million women reported that their children had seen or heard partner violence. What we're now going to look at um, in a little bit of detail is some of the information that's available in the PSS about help seeking. So this graph that's in front of you is about who women first told. The PSS also provides some information about who women accessed any kind of support from, but we're not going to have time to be able to go into detail about that. But that information is available and may be helpful if you're actually wanting to talk about the type of service that you provide and how many women might be accessing that. This particular graph um, emphasizes for us how many women are actually accessing informal support. So this is this 56.2% here. Um, so what this is showing us is that for the most recent incident of physical assault by a male cohabiting partner, so it's obviously quite a specific group, um, over half are actually getting support from a fa friend, family member, or um, coworker. And so I think what this really emphasizes for us is how important it is that women, uh, that our community in general is able to support women. This next slide is talking about um, women's access to police and justice system. Um, and the way that the data is collected for this kind of section, we're not able to collapse both sexual assault and physical assault. So they're those two different um, Colored. So we've, got, so we've got sexual assault in the darker green and physical assault in the lighter green. And what we can see is this general pattern where women are, I guess, disengaging from the criminal justice system the further that they get involved. And this is what you'd expect with any type of crime. But what we do see here, and what I think is worth noting, is this consistent difference between our dark and our light green. So our dark green being physical assault, our light green being sick. Um, sorry, other way around. Our light green being physical assault and our dark green being sexual assault. And what we can see is that across the entire kind of process, women are less involved with the criminal justice system if they've experienced sexual assault by their partner. So they're less likely to perceive it, their most recent incident as a crime. They're less likely to contact the police. They're less likely to believe that the perpetrator has gone um, has been charged and they're less likely to believe that the perpetrator has gone to court. I think that this really speaks to some of the stigma that is around sexual assault when it occurs within a relationship. What we have now is um, a bit of information about separation. So the infographic you have in front of you is around women who wanted to leave their current violent partner but never have. And we're looking at about 81,900. And this is a really kind of active number. This is about people who on the day of the survey were in a violent relationship. Um, it was with their current partner and they, and they wanted to leave at some point in that relationship. Not necessarily on that day, but you know, at some point. In addition to this 81,900, there's an, an additional 87,900 women who are currently in a relationship with a violent partner and have temporarily separated from them at some point, but um, and have obviously wanted to leave them, but are with them at, at that time. So that's an, addi an additional number. I think what's also in some ways a bit more challenging here, though, is that we've got about 40. 45.1% or 67,300 women who have never separated from a partner who they report has um, used at least one incident of violence and they have not wanted to leave that partner. So this is some of the you know, useful information that the PSS is able to provide. So what we have up now is a graph that's about women's reasons for returning. So the PSS provides quite a lot of detail about women's experiences of separation, um, why they left, why they came back, why they finally left, um, and the kind of impacts that they might have in that context. And what this graph shows is that for women who have both um, 
left and then gone back, so women who have had a temporary separation from their current cohabiting partner, and women who have left and then continued to be separated, so have had a separation from their previous cohabiting partner, the same three main reasons come up. And they come up in a bit of a different pattern, but they're still the same of about kind of six or seven reasons that are offered. These three come up as the most common. And so the reasons that women are saying that they're returning are for the sake of their children, because of the commitment to their relationship and because the partner promised to stop the violence or abuse. So what we have now is a poll question. Um, and I'd like people, if they um, feel inclined, to just give me a bit of a sense of um, how they interact with the PSS um, data. A survey form appears on screen with a question and six tick box responses. The survey question is, people may not use the PSS to talk about violence for a number of reasons. Do any of the following apply to you? Please select one response. One, I think stories are more effective than data. Two, I don't have the time to work through the data. Three, I find it confusing. Four, I'm concerned I will get it wrong. Five, it's not relevant to my work. And six, none of these apply to me. I like using the data. Okay. So what we seem to have at the moment as our um, leader in the poll is that people aren't necessarily having so many concerns about using the data, that they like using the data. Um, and then our next one after that is around people not necessarily having time to work through the data. And hopefully some of the um, work that ANROSE has done on providing infographics and providing some of this kind of summary information will help with some of that. Um, and I'm pleased to see that some of you feel confident with the data. That's always very encouraging. So this is just our um, last, I guess, piece of information. And this is about impacts on work that was found through the um, PSS data. So this data is limited to women who are employed at the time that the violence occurred um, and whether they took time off work in the 12 months after the incident of violence. And what the PSS found was that one in four women who'd experienced physical assault by um, a partner took time off for their most recent incident. So that's 145,700. And about one in five for sexual assault. Um, now the estimate for sexual assault is a lot smaller because the number of women overall who've experienced sexual assault um, in an intimate relationship is lower. So it's at about 29,900. So what we're now going to be moving on to is a bit of information about what the PSS is able to provide as far as um, the report that I have written um, as well as some of the support material that ANROSE has developed. So the report is divided into four sections. The first of those is about violence experienced by women and men, so some of that gender comparison stuff we briefly looked at. There's quite a lot more detail on that. Um, second is about women's experience of sexual assault. Third, women's experience of partner violence. And fourth, women's experience of multiple victimization. So this is women who've experienced both um, sexual assault and physical violence or a range of kind of repeated experiences of violence. There's a range of scenarios that the data examines in that section. In each of these sections, we're asking the same um, five main questions. Sometimes we, we go into more detail than others in the different ones, but the main questions kind of remain the same. And those are, how many people did this happen to? Who did it happen to? Who made it happen? What happened? And what happened after? So those are those five on the right-hand side of the screen. In addition, we've worked quite hard to try to make the data as accessible as possible. Um, so we use things like infographics, graphs, and text box to explain and demonstrate the findings of the research. Um, there's also a range of resources that we've done. So there's obviously the full report itself. There's also a summary that uses infographics. There's a full set of tables that were requested from the ABS, if you'd like to go and have a bit of a look around those and see what might be useful for you. There's some infographics that are ready for download if you'd like to be dropping them into your own presentations or um, briefing materials. And there's also some examples of how to use the data to tell a story. Um, so that was something that was published after we published the report. 
and these are hyperlinks within this document. So once you get sent the slides, you'll be able to directly go to those particular resources. So that's the main um, information about the PSS. I'll obviously be taking some questions in a moment. But before we do that, I wanted to just bring your attention to the fact that ANROSE is about to have our um, inaugural National Research Conference which will be held in Melbourne from the 23rd to the 25th of February and the website link is on the um, slide there for you if you're interested in hearing some more about what the research is telling us um, that ANRIS has been doing. Okay, thanks Peter. Um, we'll now go to some questions that have come through. Um, so just a reminder if you do wish to ask a question please type these in the chat box in the bottom left hand corner. Um, so your first question is, I'm keen to support my male clients who experience family violence. I've read on other websites much higher rates of men experiencing family violence. Can you uh, talk through the difference in your findings? Okay, so um, I suspect that the data that's being referred to here is some of the stuff that's being put out by one in three. Um, so one in three does actually base their materials on the PSS, um, which means that our responses to it, if we're actually able to use the PSS to do that, can be quite helpful. Um, and what the PSS says is that the vast majority, or majority of people who experience um, domestic violence are women. So it's about 70% of um, victims are women, um, and that about one in 20 men experience at least one incident of violence by a um, cohabiting partner. Um, so there's a much higher rate in um, female victims. Um, what it also shows is that the likelihood of a person reporting that they've experienced repeated incidents of violence is higher if that victim is female. So where the difference in the PSS that I was talking about briefly before, where it's not necessarily about domestic violence, about incidents of violence, this is one of the, one of the points where that's really important. That actually the data, when we're looking at things that indicate that there's more likely to be actually that sustained pattern of violence that would be characteristic of domestic violence, that is more likely to be seen in um, even within that kind of differential of likelihood between male and female victims, it's more likely to be seen in female victims. Okay, thanks. We have another question. Uh, I work in a regional context. I want to know what your info is relevant uh, to my clients. Where did you get your data from? Okay, so the PSS data is collected by the ABS. It's collected with a representative sample of the Australian population. Um, they do go into regional areas, however they are limited in their ability to go into remote areas. The data is considered to be representative um, and it's also weighted. So although they may not get exactly a, in their 17,000 that they collect information from, they may not get a exact representation of the entire Australian population. What what they'll then do is use the census to be able to weight those responses to be able to give these larger estimates. Okay, great, thanks. Um, with all the focus on domestic and family violence lately, I feel like we have lost a bit of focus on the sexual assault dimension of violence against women. Can you talk about your findings in relation to sexual assault? Okay, so the report that Anna has produced um, provides almost the same level of detail around sexual assault as it does about partner violence. Um, it provides the same kind of things about victim demographics, it provides information about incident characteristics. Um, so it provides a lot of that information that we've talked about, but obviously with some different numbers. As far as some kind of headline information as far as women's experience, um, the PSS shows that about 1.5 million women have experienced sexual assault and about 99% of those have experienced sexual assault by a male perpetrator. Um, I guess a, another statistic that would be a headline for that um, would be that um, when we're looking at women who, that, who have experienced sexual assault, 9 out of 10 were assaulted by a male that was known to them. So the vast majority is by people that the, the woman is familiar with. There's a very small percentage that is by a stranger. 
Okay, great. And we have a few that came through to the website. Um, so what does the data tell us about women with disabilities and their experiences of violence and their access to relevant supports? Okay, so there's a range of information available in the report on um, women with disabilities. It's included primarily in descriptions of demographics um, for different um, populations. Um, I guess one of the most important findings around women with a disability was that there was a statistically significant um, difference around their likelihood likelihood of ex having experienced multiple incidents of violence. So there's some limitations in the way that the PSS data is collected around demographics that means that it's fairly unlikely that you get a statistically significant difference. Um, that's because the demographic information is collected right at the start of the survey um, and, so it, and it's about what that person's characteristics are at the time of the survey. And that means that it's less likely that um, you're able to, you're not able to do a, analysis around data since the age of 15. You're only able to do it um, in the last 12 months. And because of that, the, um, the data is less robust. It, it has less likelihood of being able to show a statistically significant difference. So the fact that the data around um, women with a disability shows a statistically significant difference ar around this multiple victimization is quite important and it shows quite a large difference in their victimization. Great, thank you. And are younger people more susceptible to domestic violence? Do we know how today's uh, stats compare with past results in the PSS? I haven't done an analysis specifically on um, age-related demographics in previous PSS um, data, but that certainly could be possible using the data that is publicly available at this stage. Um, regarding younger women's experience of um, partner violence, what we do know is that um, Women in the 25 to 34 age range are most likely to have experienced partner violence um, when, that is, when we're talking about women who are cohabiting. And I think that that is likely, although this is just me bringing in some other knowledge, to reflect some of those different um, patterns of um, cohabitation that we might be seeing um, in kind of younger generations. What we also find is that if we're using that broader definition that in, includes girlfriend, boyfriend and date, then we do see an increased risk of um, partner violence both in the 18 to 24 and the 25 to 34 year age ranges. Okay, thanks. Um, are the numbers the actual cumulative number people, of people the PSS has surveyed over the years or is it the number estimated given 17,000 people are interviewed annually? Um, so their estimates using the, um, so the, the 17,000 people are surveyed and then those estimates are um, put into calculations using the census data to ensure that it's a representative sample. So it is certainly a extrapolation of that data to the entire Australian population. Okay, great. And we have a question from Melinda. Is there any data on violence in same-sex relationships? Yes, there is. Um, there's a little bit of data and that is certainly, there's some included within the report. Um, because of the way that the data is um, collected, um, there's more information around people, women in same-sex relationships than there are in men in same-sex relationships. And this is about um, the, the sampling that's done. So the, because the PSS is funded through the National Plan to prevent violence against women and their children, there's an oversampling of women, um, which means that when you're dealing with small populations, um, for men in particular, then you're much, you're unlikely to be able to have robust estimates. What we do have um, within the PSS report that Anna has produced is some um, information about women's experience of violence in same-sex relationships um, and what I can just actually bring that forward for us. Um, so what we're finding is about 0.3% of all women in Australia have experienced violence by a female intimate partner, so that broader definition. Um, and this is a, a number that is kind of where we might expect it to be given the relatively small population. So if we're looking at other 
sources that are showing the number of people who are in same-sex relationships. Um, for instance, the Australian Study of Health and Relationships find that 0.55% of women are in cohabiting same-sex relationships. So the estimates are always going to be relatively small. This is part of the reason why we haven't included further detail within the rest of the report around women in same-sex relationships because the estimates aren't actually able to be reliable just because the numbers are, are too small in that overall population. Okay, great. Um, for, this is a question from uh, Dina. Can you tell us anything about uh, physical or sexual violence against children? I can a little bit. Um, so what I can do, just let me bring forth some accurate numbers for us. All right. So what we have in the report, right at the end of the report, is some description around um, women reporting their own experience of um, violence. Um, so this isn't about their... It's not children reporting their violence, it's women looking back earlier in their own lives. And, and what we find there is that about 1.6, well actually 1.7 million women reported that they had experienced abuse as a child um, and that of those about um, just over half a million had both experienced abuse as a child and then partner violence as an adult. Um, Another thing that we could get from the PSS using uh, about um, women's reporting of abuse as a child is that more women reported that they'd experienced childhood sexual abuse than childhood physical abuse. So about 1.1 million women experience, reported that they experienced sexual abuse and about 900,000 reported that they experienced physical abuse. Okay, we have a question from Rob. Um, how well do you think the information in the PSS extends to Aboriginal communities? Example, the East Kimberley. Okay, so the PSS, um, the ABS is, I guess, in, in ongoing work to try to involve um, these communities in the survey. At the moment, it's um, they've made quite a strategic decision to try to ensure that their data is, um, I guess, accurate as accurate as possible. So what they've done is that at the moment they're not actually collecting demographic information about Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. They're, um, they're collecting information about people's exp Aboriginal people's experience of violence through the NIATSIS, which is a specific survey where they're actually able to ensure that they're going out into those regional and remote areas um, and getting a representative sample of that particular population. We, we do know that because the survey is representative, that there will be Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people within the survey. However, the ABS at this point in time has concerns that if they were to separate out that demographic information, it would not be representative, it would not be accurate, and it would be used inaccurately. And for that reason, they're not actually making that public at this stage. However, I am really aware of those ongoing discussions that are happening to try to ensure that the data is um, able to be used with those populations into the future. Okay, we have a question from Tanya. Uh, what does PSS and ABS stand for? Sure, okay, so the PSS is the Personal Safety Survey um, and ABS is the Australian Bureau of Statistics. So the Australian Bureau of Statistics are the people who run most of the really large government funded surveys in Australia including the census um, and PSS is the survey that they do on experiences of violence. Okay, great. And um, we have a question from Hannah. Is there any data about perpetrators, specifically if there is a differences between females perpetrating DFV and males? Okay, so there is some data that's available about um, perpetrators. However, all that data is coming from the victim's perspective. So the PSS is a victim survey. It goes to people and says, what is your experience of victimization? But in that, they ask people, who is it that did this thing to you? So they will ask both the gender and the relationship. Um, there's also some information then that can be um, taken from that, although we haven't really done it within our report, around characteristics of perpetration. But it's really important in that context to be aware that the survey is focused on victims' reports. Okay, thanks. Um, and we have a question from uh, Zeta. Data is important, but I'm keen to know how I can apply it when I'm asking the question about violence with women. How do your findings support me to ask the question? 
I think that one of the things that I could imagine the PSS data being useful for is being able to, I guess, ease that question in. So to be able to say, well, you know, I know that a lot of women experience violence. Um, I know that, you know, one in four women have experienced at least one incident of violence by a partner. I'm wondering if, you know, you've had that kind of experience. So I think that what this data helps to do is to contextualize those conversations. I think similarly, some of the data around women's experience of abuse um, in childhood could be used in a similar way. Some of the information about particular groups to be able to say, you know, we know that um, women who have these particular characteristics are more likely to have experienced violence. So I, I'm wondering whether that might be relevant to you. Okay, great. So um, uh, thank you, Peter, for your presentation and thank you to everyone for attending today's webinar. Uh, you can now register for next month's webinar, which is Understanding the Complexities in LGBTIQ Domestic and Family Violence. Please stay logged in to take our online survey, which you'll be redirected to now. We thank you in advance for your feedback and wish you a pleasant afternoon.